In a world where 35% of the population who do not have access to electricity live in India, that's as many as 579 million people. In a tropical country like India, sunshine is available for longer hours and in great intensity. In a country where it is all about abundant solar energy. A country which has great potential as a future energy source on which Indian villagers can rely on. There is one man who is relentlessly trying to tap this great energy source to transform lives. Live on NRI Same from Los Angeles, a Ramon Magsaysay award winner, an energy engineering graduate from the University of Massachusetts, Dr. Harish Handy will talk about it all and the interview will start momentarily with host Akshay Kumar. Welcome back to NRI Samai. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. This is your today's host, Akshay, live from Los Angeles. Thank you, Dr. Harish, for your time. It is an honor to you have you on our show. Good to see you today. Th thanks, thanks, Akshay. Thank you for inviting me. So, Dr. Harish, can you brief us about uh, Solar Electric Light Company, Selco, and how it has been tapping solar energy to improve livelihoods of villagers to our listeners? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Selco is basically a social enterprise uh, which is owned by uh, three not-for-profits, two of them based in the U.S., uh, basically to provide um, reliable electricity using sustainable sol source like solar to people who've never had electricity before or are fed up with the unreliability of electricity. Uh, we basically are focused in uh, in Karnataka, in one state uh, where we have 26 offices. Uh, we have catered to more than 150,000 households, and many of them were relying on kerosene and candles uh, before, and today have uh, anywhere between 10 watts to 60 watts, uh, a solar panel which actually charges a battery during the daytime, and they run anywhere between one to six lights, uh, a radio, a mobile charger, etc. So that's the philosophy of Selco to destroy three myths that poor can't afford technologies, poor can't maintain technologies, and you really cannot run a commercial venture while trying to meet social objectives. And that's the philosophy of the organization. This is really incredible work from Selco. Dr. Sarish, as a PhD graduate from University of Massachusetts, you would have got lucrative job offers, or you could have become a corporate entrepreneur, but you choose to become a social entrepreneur. So what made you to choose this path? See, I mean, more than a degree from the University of Massachusetts, uh, I, I think the, the, the philosophy was that I, I, I mean, I graduated from Indian Institute of Technology, where I, I had a subsidized education, um, and the subsidies were basically paid by, um, I, uh, by the poor people. I mean, if I paid 60 rupees a semester for, for eight semesters, uh, who paid I mean, the taxes? Like the poor, 600 million people, poor people who actually bought salt and sugar, and the taxes actually went and paid for my education. So I, I survived on subsidy in many ways, right? And and, and by, my stakeholders are the poor in this country. So whatever I have learned, I need to actually make sure that people who have who have given me that education to, to give them, I mean, to to be part of that society rather than joining as a career. career. So I, I think that was the fundamental of that philosophy, uh, Akshay. Actually, truly speaking, like uh, most of us, uh, are, I mean, really won't realize that we have been paid by the Indian citizens in terms of the taxes for our education. This is really great that, uh, I mean, you actually did this, you did this work because of the IIT Karakpur degree. This is really great. So how uh, was the response from villagers when you visited them and tried to convince them to use the solar energy to improve their livelihood? Because this is like a really a new technology and uh, which actually they never heard of. And uh, these kind of an high end technology, how the uh, receiving in villages? No, actually, see what happened was this was in the early 90s. I mean, I also when I was doing my master's and PhD, I had a chance to go to Dominican Republic um, in, in Central America, where I actually first saw pe poor people using solar and actually paying for it, bits of it. So that was the same pro thought process which actually led me to do a PhD. Uh, but I spent a lot of time then in Sri Lanka and India. The first fundamental issue was how it's not a, it was not about technology. Um, more importantly, actually, was that would 
people trust you in a sense see normally what has happened is many of the rural villages have been taken for a ride for ages i mean people from urban areas coming and giving selling and and running away from the rural areas and systems not working not only uh, not only solar but any other things right it was how do we gain the trust i mean how do how do rural people actually believe that you are one of them and that was i think fundamental learning process for me that that took 3 4 years to to basically gel that i mean i mean how do i give an analogy actually it's like when you talk to an auto rickshaw driver uh, unless and until the auto rickshaw driver does not feel you you are another auto rickshaw driver you're always in a hierarchy so i think once that trust got established and many of my first colleagues um, you know, who started off with me uh, were from the villages and so so for fundamentally it was trust human trust and then whatever you come up with technology it becomes easier oh so actually selco is mostly located in karnataka and some parts of gujarat so if someone wants to yes. receive the service of selco in another state how they can really approach you i mean what kind of a service uh, that you can offer in other, another states to a person karnataka and gujarat see actually today the the model that we have created i mean in 18 years was basically not a model that actually just purely just sells a product it's basic it's it's like how do you create a service oriented organization um and then what so so today uh, though we are based in karnataka we do parts of um, lower parts of maharashtra little bits of tamil nadu and gujarat but what we have created is an incubation center where we want other youngsters from other parts of the country to come and learn or unlearn what we have done in 18 years learn from the mistakes we have done learn from some of the successful processes and we want these youngsters to actually take these sources and because we are an open source organization take it to their own uh, state uh, and and replicate it see we believe in the model of replication rather than scale up it's like how have street vendors moved from one been one street vend- vendor in the country now we have 2 million 20 million street vendors so what we want to create is inspire incubate young entrepreneurs and and take what we have learned in 18 years and replicate whether it's bihar whether it's ap whether it's mp whether up take it from what we have learned and and that's the philosophy that we are following right now actually oh so actually uh, like in if someone wants to come or come to selco and if uh, someone wants to learn they can learn it over there and they can try to replicate it wherever they want right in any other state and and change oh. Yeah, and and change it accordingly see for example the 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 technology needs uh, the cultural behavior of a person in karnataka would be very different to a person in rajasthan would be very different to a person in up or in ap what we are telling the youngsters is this is what it is there are some variables which are very uh, intrinsic to the state of karnataka um, learn what it, what it is but go when you go back to rajasthan when you go back to up change these variables because people the banking structure the the way people use lights or energy services are different so we we want people to customize according to the district where they come from yes and so first get embedded in karnataka look at what service model is look at how the banking structure behaves how do the rural people actually react to having this technology take it, learn from it and then take it back to you. we want youngsters to just replicate and that is a much more sustainable model rather than just selling products That's really great. Actually, during the last weekend, I got an opportunity to talk with an uh, University of uh, Texas Austin graduate. And while we were discussing, he was telling like he is going to India to work uh, in uh, I mean to work with Selco in India as an intern. So uh, like how uh, how these people will approach you, and uh, uh, if someone wants to do an internship or someone wants to learn this uh, technique, so uh, what would you suggest them? Like how they can approach you and uh, Uh, from how they can take it further see one is we have a website i mean a lot of people contact us the contact us through websites uh, i mean we have selco at selco-india.com is our uh, email address or you can write directly to me at harish at selco-india.com uh, a lot of the interns we get yes we get get interns from the us uh, nri is non nri nri we get um, the interns from from europe um as well i mean the lot of these interns also come for example we have a rural lab which is based fires from bangalore in a village where 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 students actually look at problems first hand rather than 
rather than coming up with a solution, we tell the students first look at what the problem is and then come up with a solution. So, so we get these interns because we also have in many of these universities, uh, especially Yale or uh, Sloan School or 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 Stanford or uh, in a we Selco is a case study. So we get interns from class, students from who take those courses where they learn about Selco. But directly write me an email and absolutely there's a chance for everybody to actually do something. This is really great. Uh, so Dr. Harish, uh, what were your expectations on Selco in 1995 when you had started? Uh, did you expect uh, Selco in 1995 that it would be like this today? I mean, did it mean uh, no, no, your no. expectations? I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I'm 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 actually shocked. I'm I'm no, no. I'm actually shocked. I mean, I I I started off with absolutely no. It was a 93, 94 started off, and and it was an experiment. And see, how how do we actually create an enterprise that's that's for and by and for and by the people who actually need it. So it's a it has to be rural focused. It has to be run by rural colleagues of mine. It has to be a rural enterprise, and that was a experiment. And I would still say actually it's an experiment because. So uh, uh, we've just done, I mean, uh, if you say that, uh, do we know about rural after 18 years? No, hardly a one person that we know what what rural India is all about. It's still, we have a long, long, long way to go. But did we expect that we would have reached this far? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I would have, we would have taken a day at a time. And as we normally say in Selco, well, let's look at house, is it, house at a time. Electrify one house, get to another house. So, but uh, the future depends on my younger colleagues. How do they want to take this forward, actually? So. That's true. So, actually, I was going through some of the Selco case studies. One which really caught my attention was uh, Chitradurga bus project. So, actually, you have been yes. uh, lighting up the houses. And apart from that, actually, this work is more for an education of underprivileged children. Uh, uh, like. How did you come up with this idea, and what exactly happened during this uh, project? Can you brief us more about the Chitradurga bus project? No, this is actually the credit of the idea should come from. Um, the actually came from the father uh, of the Don Bosco in in Chitradurga um, town. He was interested. How does in a more very affordable manner uh, we uh, that people can educate rural schools about computers? How do we how how can rural kids touch and feel a, rural, a computer? So he came up with the idea about having a remodified bus with laptops and computers, which should grow from go from school to school. And he then approached us saying that I need a charging um, solution. Do you think that a solar can do it? So we basically sat with him uh, uh, and some of my colleagues um, from the Selco Labs uh, who who redesigned the uh, configuration of the type of laptops, type of solar charging. And then it's done in a way, now it serves dual purposes. When it goes and plonks in a school, the kids, I, I think there are eight or 12 of, of those terminals inside, and there's a blackboard inside. And um, the kids come in, uh, they sit as a classroom, the teacher teaches what are these computers. And then after that, um, uh, they, they feel and touch and, and, and work on the computers. But in the meantime, the driver of the bus would take the solar panels outside and make sure that the, the batteries that are needed to run the computers are getting charged. So kids, in the meantime, also feel what solar panels, they touch and feel, oh, this is how it's getting charged. So not only they get computer education, they get education about solar and sustainable energy. So I would give more credit to the father of this of Don Bosco, who who came up with this idea, so brilliant, and that's now we want to replicate. How do we combine education, sustainable energy, and that's the beauty of sustainable energy that it catalyzes these ty types of thoughts, these types of education tools, which we would not have otherwise. Yeah, that's true. And actually, yes, as you said, they got uh, two services. One is education, and one is uh, knowledge about the high-end technology such as uh, solar energy. Right. And so, uh, if you see about the operational cost, I guess there won't be much operational cost of using the solar energy, but maybe the initial uh, capital investment would be a little higher. Can you actually brief us about that to our listeners, that if someone wants to get the solar panel or something, so how, like, in economic point of view, like, 
how expensive it would be or how less expensive it would be compared to the regular uh, coal energy or hydropower energy that we have been using in terms of electricity. Right, Dr. See here what happens is when you are talking about the, the um, 40, 45 percent of the people uh, who do not have electricity, they rely on kerosene candles. And, and today with the, uh, with the advance of mobile technology, a lot of the poor also have uh, mobile phones because the landlords might call them any time for labor work. So, so if you look at the cost, the, the expenditure, expense part of the poor when the, uh, of a typical uh, household on kerosene candles and mobile charging, at least between 15 to 18 percent of their monthly income goes towards this expenditure. Giving an example, in, in, in poorer parts of Karnataka where uh, are on kerosene and candles they spend anywhere between 140 to 150 rupees. And for mobile charging, people spend five rupees a charge in the nearest town, and they do eight charges a month. That's 40 rupees. So 140 plus 40, it's 180 rupees. Take it as 200 rupees, multiplied by 12. So they spend 2,400 rupees a year, multiplied by five, at least 10,000 plus, right? But for an equivalent uh, two-light system and a mobile charger, the cost of a solar system is around 7,500 and if they take a bank financing for five years it comes down to with interest 8,500 rupees which is cheaper than what they are spending on kerosene candles and mobile charging in and so in a spit and, and instead of spending for kerosene and candles that 180 rupees they actually pay, gave it to the bank so not only they have a light now they have an asset so, so that's the model, like how do we create financial products that match people's cash flow? That is where we break the myth of being expensive. So typical systems for us cost anywhere between, for one light, between 5,000 rupees to a four light system that people pay 16,000 rupees. And as the systems go higher, and for example, a hostel, uh, there are people who, who spend 80,000, one lakh for orphanages or for temples or mosques. But typically, the range that we cater to is between anywhere between 5,000 to 16,000. The critical part is not the cost of the solar system, but how do we provide financing that matches people's cash flows? So it is like a highly affordable, and yeah, as uh, you are telling, yeah, so people can easily uh, use it for their regular uses. Like so that, actually, I'm yeah, about, yeah, right. Like, like, yeah. Actually, I see a street vendor. If you look a street vendor in Hyderabad or a street vendor in Bangalore or a street vendor in Hubli or Nagpur, typically spends anywhere between 12 to 18 rupees per day on kerosene. That's, that's approximately 450 rupees a month, which is $10, right? $10 for four hours of kerosene lighting that you and me don't spend for one light for four hours. And, and the same $10 or 450 rupees is equivalent to buying a 30,000 rupee product. What she actually needs is one light for four hours, which via solar costs six rupees. So today she's spending 15 rupees and solar actually costs six rupees. So, so that's where we compare. Okay, the, as you go poorer into the economic strata, the energy costs actually become more expensive. So it's a cash flow financing like you, Anybody in the U.S. who buys a house could have afforded a house only because financing was available. Or many a time cars, it's because financing is available. So many of the poor, solar is affordable, only financing is there. So uh, actually, as we're talking about the financing and financing from the banks, so initially we heard that the banks were little reluctant to provide some kind of financial support uh, for the villagers when they went there and uh, when they asked for the loans to buy the solar equipment. But uh, we heard that Selco actually intervened with the banks and the villagers to help them in getting the finances for the uh, solar techniques. So can you just uh, tell us about uh, that process? Like how did it happen? Yeah. See, in the early 90s or mid 90s, I mean, obviously a lot of people did not know solar. And secondly, during that time, there were a lot of solar systems that were installed by the government in panchayats and, and the systems were not working. So there was a bad name for solar that solar does not work. That's because the battery was not there or servicing was very poor. So the banks, or one, in some banks, they knew things had failed. In the other banks, there was absolute lack of awareness. And the banks would say that if I service these systems, if I actually finance these systems, 
and things don't work, then the non-performing asset is on my books. The risk, I am taking the risk of financing. This is what the banks would say. So that took us quite some time from 95 to 99 to convince many of these financial institutions that no, these things work. Uh, we will create local uh, service centers where local youths or local managers would go and service the systems in a way that it will not be a risk on your portfolio. In, in some other places, what we also did was we took the risk and placed some guarantee money in these financial institutions just to get out that first fear. Yes, and, and there was another champion, Mr. Urupa, who's the, who was the cham chairman of Malaprabha Gramin Bank, who actually took the risk and said, let's do it. Let's, let, let me as a banker start it. And you always, actually, as you know, we need, a one, champ we need one champion somewhere who can light it, and then, then things actually open up. But that's why I said the young entrepreneurs, you need to have that patience. You have to have that patience and a bit of passion, and it'll all pay off. Don't rush things. That's, that's the, that's, it took us four years, yes. But, but if you see now Karnataka, most of the banks finance solar lighting without asking, oh, how does it actually work? It is because of the uh, successful model that Selco had provided for the past 15 years. This is really great. So, uh, Dr. Harish, what was the best project that Selco had finished so far, and why did you feel this project as the best project? I mean, what made you uh, feel like this is like yeah, the best project that Selco had achieved? I think, uh, I, I mean, because it's, uh, there are so many, but the, I would say the most recent one, uh, Akshay, um, if you know, there's a community called a Siddhi community. Siddhis are, are African, uh, they were Africans from Tanzania and Mozambique who were brought in by the British a couple of centuries ago. And half of them were left in Karnataka and half of them in Gujarat. So there are 50,000 Siddhis. And if, you, if I show you their photographs, they just look, look, look like Africans. But, but because of the color of the skin and because of the behavior, they, they've not been able to integrate into the society. And if you ask a Siddhi family, can you come to the bank, they'll say, I don't want to go to the bank because bank has glass doors. And they're earning 1,200, 1,300 rupees. So what, we, what my, our colleagues basically did was went to the local bank, and, and the local bank was very hesitant because these uh, saying that we don't know the credit evaluation of these Siddhis, would they pay back? And they were earning 1,200, 1,300 rupees. So with 32 families, uh, we put up 8,000 rupees two light system and same like a mobile charger. We, the banker, we went and banker, the banker said put 100% guarantee and we put 100% guarantee against these 32 families and, and they had light. And after six months, we went and asked the bank, are you happy? The bank was extremely happy. And I said, you remove your 80%, I don't need these, are, these guys are brilliant in terms of paying. And when we went and asked the Siddhis, are you happy with the light? They said more than the light, we are, we are happy that we, we are now bankable. We have a bank account, and once a solar loan is done, we will go and take a loan for a sewing machine. That means a confidence that I can actually do more with a loan. I can actually improve my life. I think this got replicated. I, I would say this encompasses the whole philosophy of, of, of finance, uh, the quality of life, the quality of thought process that now I'm integrated into the society. It's a much greater social impact than anything else, Akshay. This is great. So actually, if uh, someone wants to learn more about uh, solar, uh, I mean, solar technology, like in, you know, degree uh, as a technical degree or specialization in solar engineering, do we have like in uh, uh, institutions which are actually offering much deeper into this field and how actually India is responding to this solar energy? Yeah, I mean, and both in the U.S. and Euro U.S., Europe, and India, there are quite a few. Uh, if you look at technical de degrees, there are quite a few of the universities actually offer, right from University of Massachusetts, MIT, University of Delaware, Texas, um, Berkeley, Stanford. A lot of these in engineering schools in the U.S. offer. IIT Bombay has a full five-year degree on energy, energy services and technology. IIT Kharagpur used to have, but I, a lot of the IITs and RECs or NIT case have a, you know, engineering courses for, for solar technology. But more important, Akshay, is, is not only learning about technology, but how do you bring in the social aspect when you learn about technology becomes more important. 
And that is critically missing in many of these educational institutions. So I, I would say, for example, Yale uh, School, the, the SOM, the School of Management, in fact, brings in that philosophy of both social entrepreneurship and engineering uh, and taking the expertise of your engineering degree. Uh, I think one of the very few that I know which, uh, which combines social engineering as well as hard engineering. But a lot of schools actually offer that. But I tell to a lot of the listeners and youngsters around the world is, is not only learning engineering technology, but how do you make sure that, this, that how, how can you apply it on the ground? For that, uh, no book will be enough. It, you need to spend time on the ground. That's great. So actually, India is mostly depending on the th uh, thermal power of coal or hydropower. And coal can be extinct one day if you keep on digging it. Or uh, hydropower, it mainly depends on rain in that year. So a country with 1.2 billion population definitely needs an alternative on which can, which can rely for a long time. And of course, world exists as long as sun exists. So as a solar energy expert, how would you see the role of this technology in future? Like what kind of a role it can play? Because we are really not sure about this coal and uh, hydropower. It's more than that, and if, if uh, many of the listeners would see, there's a, there's a big coal scam going on in India called the Coal Gate, um, and and uh, the allocation of coal blocks in India. But also, if you see in the last couple of years, uh, both the combination of increased ash content in India's coal, and on top of it, Indonesia has heavily taxed the export of coal from Indonesia to India and China. So for many of the companies who are uh, who the thermal power plants here in India the intake, the input, which was assumed to be cheap, that is coal, is no longer cheap. And, and with additional problems of land degradation as well as the tribal movements, it's becoming more and more socially as well as financially extremely, socially very unsustainable, but financially more expensive. India has no choice but to look at alternatives. And I'm not only talking about solar access. I'm basically talking of mix of solar, small, very small hydro, pico hydro. I'm not talking of large hydro small wind, biogas, biomass, India is perfectly placed to look at these solutions because we have 500 million people without electricity. We have a lot of poor people. Best way to connect sustainable energies like solar, pico hydro, biogas, biomass to eradicate poverty, in a way you kill two birds, you basically have two solutions, sustainable energy for climate as well as poverty alleviation and create models that are very applicable to the rest three and a half billion people in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. India is in that position of, of being that soft superpower of solutions. I think that is the importance that this country can actually now offer. And, and coal is just becoming expensive. Hydro, large hydro dams, absolute land problems and issues. And nuclear, obviously, the issues of safety and, again, the protests, as you, a lot of you must have heard in the last one week or two weeks, extreme protests on both sides. So I think uh, India needs to look at sustainability much more seriously because it's, it's the only thing that it can uh, bank on. That's true. Actually, we have a caller, uh, Srikant from Tirupati, and uh, uh, he would like to ask you a question. Sure. Hello. Hello. Hello? Yeah, hello. Good I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to ask you a question. Now, as we can see, our government's thermal power is very strong. Why is it that our solar system, or coal power system, why is it not going to be able to do it? आपने सही कहा कि जो न्यूक्लियर पावर प्लांट के अगेंस्ट में जो एजिटेशन जो चल रहा है चेन्नई में और फिशरमैन भी जिनकी जाने गईं और और कोल के लिए भी काफी जो कोल स्कैम हो रहा है हाँ तो हम एक है कि ये जो जागरण जो है 
खाली दो तीन स्टेट में हुई है रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी की जो जागरण है यूपी और कर्नाटक और थोड़ा थोड़ा से महाराष्ट्र में लेकिन डिसेंट्रल एनर्जी जो है ये जो लोकल एंटिटीज जो है एपी हो एपी में नेट कैप है आई थिंक नेट कैप को ज्यादा रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी लेना होगा एंड uh, uh, जैसे क्रेडर है कर्नाटक में जिसने काफी रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ली है बट लोकल यूथ अभी यंगस्टर्स जो है उनको मोर पॉजिटिव अप्रोच लेना होगा भाई साहब इन अ सेंस कि ये नहीं कि गवर्नमेंट सब कुछ करेगी उनको भी कुछ एक ध्यान आना चाहिए कि हमें क्या करना चाहिए ये देश के लिए हर समय बोल सकते हैं गवर्नमेंट काम नहीं करी गवर्नमेंट करप्ट ठीक है बट हमारा भी कर्तव्य को हमें हमें देखना पड़ेगा तो यंगस्टर्स जो है उनको भी जागरण इसलिए हमने ये इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर इसीलिए खोला ताकि यंगस्टर्स में एक जागरण हो जाए कि उन उनका भी एक व्यक्तित्व ये होता है रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी होता है कि करने के लिए आई थिंक वहां चेंज होने वाला है बिकॉज ये प्रोटेस्ट में मैं नहीं मानता हूँ क्योंकि प्रोटेस्ट में हम ये मानते हैं कि सोल्यूशन इज द बेस्ट फॉर्म ऑफ प्रोटेस्ट यंगस्टर्स हैव टू क्रिएट सोल्यूशन टू शो दैट यस कोल इज नॉट पॉसिबल शो दैट न्यूक्लियर इज नॉट पॉसिबल अभी क्या है प्योरली सब जगह प्रोटेस्ट चल रहे हैं लेकिन सोल्यूशन बहुत कम जन दिखा रहे हैं आई थिंक यंगस्टर्स को दिखाना है कि सोल्यूशन इज द बेस्ट फॉर्म ऑफ प्रोसेस था हम हम पहले तो कर्नाटक में शुरू किए कि काफी कॉलेज में हम ये कंपटीशन रखते हैं लेकिन कंपटीशन खाली कंपटीशन के इसके द्वारा नहीं इन द सेंस उनको हम अपने फोल्ड में लेके क्या करना चाहिए फ्यूचर क्या करना चाहिए आपको क्या ट्रेनिंग चाहिए पैसा चाहिए उन आपको सोच आपका सोच बदलने के लिए काफी कुछ किए अगर आपके पास कोई है स्टूडेंट्स जो आप सोचते हैं कि फ्यूचर में काफी कुछ कर सकते हैं प्लीज विदाउट हेजिटेशन जस्ट सेंड इट टू अस हमारे वहां भेज दीजिए एंड एंड हम देख लेंगे कि क्या करना चाहिए बिकॉज वही हमारा इंक्यूबेशन सेक्टर का वही मकसद है कि यंगस्टर्स को हम कैसे इंस्पायर ताकि वो जाके अपने ही स्टेट में कुछ कर सके सो so, आपके पास अगर कोई भी है स्टूडेंट्स 10, 15, 20, 100, 100, प्लीज प्लीज सेंड देम टू अस थैंक यू श्रीकांत थैंक यू फॉर आस्किंग द क्वेश्चन सो डॉक्टर हरीश uh actually uh, how did indian entrepreneurs uh, are responding towards this uh, solar energy like uh, how is the solar energy industry uh, is in india right now like how much they have advanced there are, there are two aspects to the solar industry in india one is the large scale see there's something called the on grid um and one is the off grid off grid when i uh, what we have been speaking for last half an hour is mostly on the off grid Uh, but the the larger push has been on the on grid on grid in the sense you have megawatt 1 megawatt 3 megawatt 5 megawatt 10 megawatt and gujarat has been a leading state of putting this large uh, power plants which then feed into the main lines they they do not go for individual house consumption but they go into the main lines that has taken off big time because the incentives in the large is much more and so the big companies have played a large role in putting up the uh, solar panels so the cost of solar also if you look at in india uh, in the last 5 years has dropped by more than 60 to 70% so the movement is there but i feel it's my, my i feel is that it should be more in the direction of off grid rather than on grid because those are the people who need it uh, putting up a 5 megawatt plant to actually feed into a 2000 megawatt coal fired plant is drop in the ocean rather than break the 5 megawatt plant into multiple small solar panels so there's a direct social impact so the, the lot of the poor can get electricity today and because many of these power lines don't reach out to the poor but overall if you look at yes it india has made it quite good on the solar i mean it's looked at the looked as the largest second largest market i mean uh, from a need based point of view okay so actually india is the largest producer of uh, fruits or vegetables or even milk but most of the food actually it is getting wasted before it reaches to the consumer so like right. how you do, how do you see that uh, 
this solar because actually the main problem is with the lack of proper cold. refrigeration or cold storage in India, uh, especially in rural areas because of the poor right. electricity that they would be getting. So how would you see that uh, right. this solar energy would be helping them to come up with such an innovative uh, cold storages so that they can actually preserve the food for more days, thereby we can actually uh, control the prices of uh, fruits or vegetables? No, the two aspects here, Akshay, the, 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 the primary aspect is that, okay, yeah, that you need to have cold storage units. Not only you need to have cold storage units, but you need to have what you call it as a smaller unit so that the smaller farmers can have access to it, not only the large guys, okay? One is that. Secondly is the how do you have store, uh, the transportation systems also having the same cold storage system. Sometimes a lot of the food gets uh, rotten in, in this transportation itself, right? But, but and, and then because till date, many of these cold storage units were assumed to run on grid electricity. So efficiency was never taken into consideration. And uh, and a lot of these refrigeration units were highly inefficient because you assume grid to be infinite and who cares and you're, and, and you're paying very low on electricity costs. I'm really not bothered about the efficiency of the cold storage. But what has happened with exactly the reason you said that a lot of the middle and the small case farmers were losing out. Now there's been a big push by some of these large companies, right, from Godrej to uh, other companies who are who are building up this high efficient cold storage systems, could, which could actually efficiently work on hybrid solar and and grid. Where, and depending on if there is six hours of unreliable grid, let's use the grid, and the rest number of hours it works on solar, vice versa. So you will see that drastic change in the next next couple of years for sure in the cold storage scenario. That's great actually. So, uh, I mean, for, uh, to as a follow-up for that question, so worst hit sector during the power crisis are the small-scale industries too. And how can these uh, small-scale right. industries can be benefited using solar energy as we were, as we were discussing about the combination of different, different uh, kinds of energies as like solar energy with some hydro energy or solar energy with solar energy in a combination. Uh, how do you think that uh, it's going to work for the small-scale industries? And does government of India offer any help for them if they want to upgrade it to solar energy to minimize the dependence on regular power supply? Uh, no, before even looking at solar or before looking at any of the other sustainable technologies, first we need to look at the efficiency of the the the, the tools that people are using. If you look at any rural area where People use welding machines or, or silk weaving machines or the small motors and grinders. It's in, extremely inefficient. I mean, like a simple thing like a sewing machine, uh, which uh, for a certain, like a sari and a blouse or something else, it just requires 30 watts. But the minimum available is anywhere between 110 watts to 150 watts, right? So even if you design solar, you're designing solar for the inefficiency of this sewing machine, and everybody blames solar to be expensive. Nobody talks about the swing machine to be inefficient. First, we, we need to look at, and in like many of these machinery shops, unnecessarily use lights during daytime because of the, the poorly designed uh, factories with absolutely no concept of daylighting. So I think the first low-hanging fruit is energy efficiency. How do we actually look at daylighting? How do we look at making sure that the welding uh, instruments that people are using us are of the most efficient and then the second step is towards looking at sustainable energy today if in, a, in many of the states just purely concentrating on energy efficiency and transmission and distribution losses you can save millions of units of electricity and then sustainable energy makes economic sense so so from a government of India point of view, there's been a lot of push by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, where Ajim, Dr. Ajay Mathur runs it, there's a lot of push for energy efficiency, but um, that's a positive point. On the negative point, for many of the small guys, the SME sector, uh, really the incentives to push to, to change over to sustainable energy, it has not yet percolated down. It will take time, but sadly it has not percolated down from the, from the government policy side. Actually, we have a question from uh, Srikant. Actually, his name is also Srikant. He's from Los Angeles. Uh, he would like to ask you a question. Okay. Srikant, go ahead. Sure, sure. Dr. Harish, uh, just a quick question. When I, when I was listening to your uh, conversation, 
you mentioned that we'll use, we'll be using the regular power uh, as and when it is available, and then we switch to solar whenever it is not available. So, uh, I, I was wondering uh, right now in my in my home in Vijayawada, where my parents are there, we have the regular power, and then we have an inverter. Whenever the power is gone, we switch to the inverter. I was just wondering, uh, in a, in a micro level. For my house, is it possible I can have the regular power going on, and on the other side I can switch it to solar power? How feasible is this? Uh, and then can you elaborate on that uh, a little bit, uh, Dr. Harish? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Shikant. See, what I was saying that it's not in many of the households. See, for example, the 150,000 households that we have done, 60% uh, of these households never have never had electricity, so solar is the only option. But for the 40% of the people who have the grid power and also using solar. They actually use solar daily uh, and use power as a backup. If something, fa if the solar fails during the, some sort of rainy or it's too cloudy or something goes wrong, then they use power as a backup in a sense, okay. That's what we say because unlike an inverter which uses it in an emergency, the solar is getting charged by sun anyhow. So, so why not you take advantage? The sun is going to come tomorrow and charge it. Never use it as an emergency but, you, emergency, but use it as a primary source. And if there is something goes wrong with the solar, then use the power. So you also not only have the advantage of saving on the electricity bills, which in fact the inverter, uh, as you would have noticed, Mr. Shikant, in your house, that once you have put the inverter, after that the electricity bills have gone up. It will not come down. So, so, so but uh, your question being hybrid, that can it run? Yes, it's highly feasible. In many of the households that we have done, it's, Either people, uh, we do a hybrid system that uh, that is just like a water tank. You have a water tank out of your house. It some part of it comes from the stairs, from the corporation, and some part comes from your bore well. So depending on what is shortage, you actually fill the water tank with the rest. The same thing you can actually do with solar. Oh wow! Okay, that sounds great. Thank thank you, Dr. Harish, for explaining this. Thanks. Thank you, Chikant, for calling us. Uh, so, Dr. Harish, actually, uh, Government of India has a mission, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's National Solar Mission, or uh, Solar India yes. Mission, mm -hmm. under National Action Plan mm -hmm. on Climate Change in 2010, and they have a right. uh, like a 10 year action plan. How do you think that it's going to help the power sector by 2020? Well, um, actually, um, if you want to hear my actual views, a lot of the listeners might switch off their radio, but the, that, but they're coming. The see, it, it came up as a very genuine uh, mission. Uh, it was part of the eight mission strategy uh, after the PMO's office that we will do uh, 20,000 megawatts by 2020. And out of the 20,000 megawatts, 18,000 megawatts for for was for the on grid, the larger solar systems, and the 2,000 megawatts was for the off grid. Uh, I would have been happy if it was vice versa, but that's where it is. But today, uh, uh, the first phase completes, I, somewhere in December, the first phase will complete of the JSN and Devanal Nehru Solar Mission. We're short, big time short. I mean, we, not, we will not be able to reach the targets. So there will be a big change in the second phase where uh, there has to be a retrospection of what has failed and what has not, what has actually worked. And you will see that uh, whatever has worked small in Karnataka and UP in the smaller sector, if they ramp it absolutely by 2020, a um, lot of the rural households would have got benefited by the by the solar mission. I feel somehow feel Akshay that that uh, by 2020, um, the I I think the off grid will be a huge success, but I would question the on grid. Now, I doubt the on grid. On grid would be as successful as the off grid. Thank you, Dr. Harish, for your honest opinion on that. Actually, we have a, uh, a listener who is actually asking a question on our online. So his name is Pradeep, and he's okay. from Machlipat, and he's actually a student. Okay. His question is: At present, the cost of solar energy generation is 13 crores per megawatts. Is it possible to decrease its cost? Yeah, it, it, I mean, the thing is that it's much less than that right now. If you look at the bidding by the large guys in the last, in the last uh, 
uh, bidding process of the Jawaharlal Nehru, it, it was much lower than that. The issue is, uh, what I uh, would tell the, the listener who has sent you, is that today what says uh, we are comparing apples and oranges. So the thing is that, um, that's why in the off-grid sector, we are actually comparing it to today, people spend much more on five times to eight times more on kerosene. If you look at the cost of kerosene and the output that kerosene provides in terms of the light intensity, the candles, right? It's much more than that. So even, even for example, in whichever city in Hyderabad, or you talk about anywhere, Secunderabad or Machi Patnam, people have cars, right? But on an Excel sheet, I can prove it that going by bus is cheaper than car. But people still take car. Why? It's because it's safe. They think it's safe. They are in control of their time. They are empowered that I can go at any time and come back at any time. I don't have to depend on those things. This is exactly a lot of the poor people think that way. And when I have solar, I don't have to depend on anybody else. I switch on at what time I need. And I need it when my daughter has to open the door and see somebody else. I have solar. I am not worried about the safety. A lot of these things do not have, cannot be determined by economics or on an Excel sheet. I think that's where I would hesitate in comparing, saying that this is what it costs, because today even in coal, yes, it, co it costs much less, four cores, A6 crores, but we are not, one is calculating the externality, the cost of the environment, what it does. Secondly, the number of coal miners who are the largest employees in the coal sector are paid pathetic, 20 to 25 rupees. This is huge subsidies that the coal miners actually provide us. If they all start charging the market prices, the cost of coal is much more than what we, it looks like. So so I, I think it's the holistic perspective that we need to look at. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Actually, he, uh, he has an, another question too. So his question is more about the nuclear reactor. So Japan is closing their nuclear reactors by 2030. And actually, we are going to depend on nuclear uh, energy as 25% of total generation. And we are having more resources. But why government is looking at other alternatives like solar, wind, geothermal, and biomass? No, I'm actually asking the same question, Akshay, to the government. I, am, <laughs> I cannot answer. I'm exactly asking the same question. We are a country not only that can we can use those sources that you just mentioned, Akshay, but we can actually show it to the other parts of the world, like Africa, Latin America, that this is a sustainable way of going. We take, a, we take that leadership position in the non-aligned movement by providing solutions, absolutely not by having nuclear plants with, with so much uncertainties around safety, so much uncertainties towards land, and so much uncertainty is towards the whole, uh, how do we uh, look at the waste? I'm asking the same question. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer, but that's, I'm sometimes puzzled. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Actually, uh, we have another question. It is about uh, uh, anti-dumping tax, which actually uh, some of the solar manufacturers want to have that anti-dumping tax because they are feeling like uh, other uh, countries from where we are importing solar equipment uh, at a much lesser price than, we're, uh, than how much that we can make it. So what do you think that about this anti-dumping tax and if we get that anti-dumping uh, tax, so do you think that uh, the solar, uh, I mean, solar panel or anything is going to be uh, priced higher? No, see the thing is that I don't, see the thing, I don't know whether I would agree to that Akshay in terms of the anti-dumping because the thing is that yeah China maybe in the sense that because China also in a way controls its uh, currency valuation and 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 provides extremely cheap debt to its companies and nobody else is able to compete and especially in the U.S. Uh, nobody is able to compete but. From an India point of view, I think it, we should be more interested what does solar energy actually do? Because the thing is that we should be more interested in the downs, the value chain in the downside. Like in a sense, what can electricity do? How do we increase the incomes of the poor people? How do we make the energy, energy efficiency of lathe machines, um, income generating products that all the SMEs that you were talking about? How do we look at 
how do we make the uh, the uh, market the assets the how do we look at uh, manufacturing side um, so for all this energy is an input let the input be input let us not deeply concentrate on should we compete on the input side let's start competing on the output side which is more valuable for the world and rather than bickering on the input side because let the world let us buy solar from wherever in the world is that's the input side let us concentrate on the output which is 10 times 15 times 20 times will create more jobs than on the input side that's why i'm really not very much on this anti dumping dumping because that's a very manufacturing of solar panel is such a small part of the whole benefit okay so uh, dr harish what problems did you face in making your dream of selco into reality and what suggestions would you like to give to young aspirants of social entrepreneurship because at that time it's kind of a new way to start the social entrepreneurship right like back in 1995 so what problems that you expected which you are actually unexpected before starting them first thing i said either there are for the young entrepreneurs is two things either you're not married or you have a fantastically understanding spouse so this is very real. If your spouse has to be, there, and I have a great spouse, absolutely, who lets me go for two, three years, four years, and that I think, and uh, that's very important to have a family support, whether it's parents or spouse, that can actually ha make this happen. Because family pressure or tension is worse than any business tension that you can actually have. And secondly, I tell to a lot of these entrepreneurs is that before, I mean, because of the so-called um, the social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc., a lot of these youngsters jump onto these these public, what you call it, as media savviness, rather than spending more time in the in the rural areas to understand. Because see, when you are in the early 20s or mid 20s, you have no money, and nobody knows you, so you have nothing to lose. Travel, travel, travel. Find. In immerse yourself. No amount of case studies on the internet or books will actually teach you what it is. Spend those time, especially for us, for Indians, whether it's NRI or whether it's India, we, are, we come from a very protective circle. Our parents protect us so much, you hardly see an Indian backpacking. Right? You hardly see an Indian on a Home Depot, actually, I want to build a pool. So I think we need to become more hands-on and spend more time in the rural areas of what you from ingrained couple of years, not just volunteerism, but couple of years, and have a fantastically understanding spouse if you were plan to get married. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Actually, we have a caller, uh, Sri Hari from Los Angeles, and uh, he would like to ask a question. Sure, sure. Yeah, hello, Sri Hari? Hello? I think it's yeah, this is Srikanth again. Sorry, uh, Dr. Harish. Uh, I had another question about the incubator, uh, uh, Selco incubator project that you mentioned. I was trying to understand, let's imagine I have 10 folks who would be interested to, to come over and then let's imagine they're motivated crowd and who wants to help their town or city uh, or, or village they want to transform. Uh, so. Uh, what is all about this incubator project and uh, what is the time frame uh, for this and once they're done with this course, did you, can you share some experiences of few folks who came in there, uh, took those experiences and then imbibed in their villages or something of that nature? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shikhan. See, what we did, I mean, we did a pilot uh, 2010 and 2011 on which basis that we started the incubation full-fledged from July 1st. We picked up 40 people. Um, and then I think um, after the first three days of field visit, 25 of them dropped out. And finally, finally we chose four. And those four uh, were asked to serve in four of our 26 offices where they were reporting to the manager of each of these offices for, for a couple of months, went to the banks, went to rural clients, went to the local church, temple. How are people using getting them confidence that these are different type of people who actually use solar for different type of purposes. How does the financing work? work? And then f finally they went like two from Maharashtra, one from UP and one from, uh, one from Bihar and one from West Bengal. And then after they went back, we actually asked them to prepare a business plan of now what you have learned, go back, 
come back to us, create a business plan. What do you think you can do in five years? So we, we for example, we walked with a couple of them, we sat, drilled holes into their business plan. This was what they wanted to do in five years. Took that business plan, also shopped it around to pay social investors who could invest in it. That's what we would do. It's not only just training them in what it is or imbibing, okay, this is the need-based uh, technologies that you need to respect, et cetera, et cetera, but also stand on our behalf. This is the same issue that we faced, Srikant, many, many years ago, uh, that how do I negotiate with a banker or how do I negotiate with an investor? Um, and I would lose out because there's nobody on our side. We said, let us play the role that we thought were missing when we were starting out. So incubation does not mean just training and, okay, fine, you go. Like We want to follow up till they can stand on their own legs, negotiate with potential social investors that that money flows into and they can start a business of their own, a social enterprise of their own. That's that's the whole thing, we're end-to-end. -end. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Harish. Thank you, Srikant. Actually, we have uh, another caller, uh, Sri Hari. He is from Los Angeles, and he would like to ask you a question. Sure. sure. Hey, Harish, sure. namaste. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts sure. on the radio. Sure. Uh, sir, I would like Thank to you, ask, uh, uh, do you think the uh, Gujarat government is uh, on the forefront of uh, using the solar energy because we see a lot of uh, reports and uh, uh, and images but uh, do you think that's uh, that's the path the other governments uh, in the at the state level also should take do you think that's uh, helping or is it uh, only for the headlines no no it has, it's not for the headlines i mean they've done some work definitely on the large grid uh, definitely not on the i mean one of some of them uh, some of the systems that are, they have put innovatively on the canals of narmada to not only generate electricity as well as to take in uh, so, so to reduce the evaporation of water those are the, those are creative those are innovative um, and those are large projects but but i from if i look at realistically what india actually needs is off grid these are large projects that feed into large power plants. It's a drop in the ocean. When the power plant is generating 2,000, 2,500 megawatts, you're putting three, five megawatts with a drop in the ocean. It would have been more socially sustainable if, if those large systems were broken up and given to individual households. Because India is decentralized in its nature. I think that's where the other states should replicate, saying that how do we look at decent rather than just putting up? See, there are two things what people have to look at solar. Solar, large solar, I, it, one is needs lots of water for regularly cleaning the panels. And water is another resource that's very expensive and it will become more socially un, uh, uh, controversial. And large plants need a lot of solar panels. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, you need large tracts of land. We can always say that, okay, we, Rajasthan has lots of tracts of land. Yes, you're going to put solar panels then, but how are you going to transport water to clean the panels? Because one layer of dust reduces the efficiency by 20%, 18%. You need water. So it's not, it's very easy to say, okay, we're going to put it in non-ariable lands, but you need water. So it's a combination of good land and good for putting up large plants. Uh, Shihariji, I... I I, 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 I'm not a big supporter of large stuff, of whether it's large cooler or large coal or large solar. It's uh, uh, how do you balance between uh, when you do environmental stuff, it also needs to balance with social stuff. You cannot, cannot unilaterally say it's environmentally friendly while there's another resource like water being wasted. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sri so, Dr. Harish, do you have any message for our listeners, especially for listeners who wish to do something in future related to solar technology? I think, I mean, uh, especially to, I would, I would cater to the youngsters that um, this is a time to look at the poor in the world. I'm not talking poor in India itself because poor or poor, poor, whether it's a poor Sri Lankan, a poor Latino, or a poor Mexican, or a poor Indian, it's all, all has have similar issues that speak different languages. I think uh, the future of any country uh, in, uh, will be dependent on how do we create sustainable business models for the 4 billion people who don't have anything. A lot of the stuff in America and Europe has happened in a sense. You see there's a gradual decrease, the economic downturn, et cetera, et cetera. So the future is going to lie in the 4 billion people 
fortunately or unfortunately, most of the 4 billion people live in India. So I think the youngsters, whether it's NRI youngsters or whether Indians themselves, do have an opportunity here. Yes, it's going to be a little bit of struggle. But again, if you look at America being a developed country, somebody struggled many years ago to make that country what it is today. When you talk about the roads, the communication, we can all praise, but somebody did sacrifice many years ago. I think that's where the poor 4 billion are calling that, that sacrifice, and especially to Indians, that we need to do that today. Thanks very much, Dr. Harish. Actually, it was really a great uh, answers, and you, I mean, for your honest answers too. So, yeah, uh, this is it uh, from our show. We truly appreciate you coming on air and interacting with our Thank listeners you. around the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Akshay. So, Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. So that's it, friends, for today. And uh, we have seen Dr. Harish answering, his, uh, answering our questions. And he made his point very clear for our second question about when, we, uh, when I asked him that, okay, uh, as a PhD graduate from University of Massachusetts, then he simply replied saying, no, I'm the first IIT graduate where I studied from, uh, I studied using taxpayers' money of India, so let me give that back to the taxpayers. So he made his point very clear that what he's going to do, and he has been doing that for the past 15 years on the ground level, and he did a really uh, commendable job over there. And uh, he uh, opened about uh, off-grid and on-grid industries and how the solar energy is going to play a re really big role in the households as off-grid. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Harish. And do tune on every weekend for many such incredible sh shows, same time, 9.30 p.m. India time, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern time, and 11 a.m. Central time. You can also listen to all our archives at youtube.com slash NRI Samai. If you like to work, if you like the work we do at NRI Samai, please do like us on facebook.com slash NRI Samai and youtube.com slash NRI Samai. Also, please let your friends and family know about our shows and spread the message. Uh, this is Akshay Kumar signing off. And you guys have a great week ahead.